Hello everyone and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today I'm delighted to talk again to Hamza Zortzis. You're most welcome, sir. Assalamu alaikum, Paul. How are you? Walaikum assalam. It's great to see you. I'm fine thinking. How are you? I'm very good. Good to see you. Excellent. Um, Hamza hardly needs uh, any introduction, but just in case some would like one, um, I'll just mention that he is the author of the best-selling book, here we are, The Divine Reality, God, Islam and the Mirage of Atheism. This is the newly revised edition. So um, if you don't have it, uh, please get a hold of it. It is very, very good, actually. Um, and Hamza is also a public, a popular public speaker, instructor, essayist, and has a master's and postgraduate certificate in philosophy from the University of London. He is uh, currently continuing his postgraduate studies in the field. And today, Hamza has kindly agreed to discuss issues arising from his phenomenally successful book, The Divine uh, Reality. And I'd like to begin the conversation by uh, quoting from a powerful passage towards the uh, beginning of the book. Um, uh, and it's just one paragraph where you uh, write the following. Irrespective of whether you consider yourself a Muslim, atheist or skeptic, I invite you to read this book with an open heart and mind. I truly believe that if you respond to this invitation, one of the conclusions you will reach is that atheism is an intellectual mirage and that the Islamic conception of God is coherent and true. Once you read this book, you will see that the phrase intellectual mirage is an apt description for atheism. A mirage is an optical illusion that we experience due to atmospheric conditions. Likewise, the conditions that facilitate the denial of the divine are based on false assumptions about the world, incoherent arguments, pseudo-intellectual postulations that veil emotional issues, and on occasion, egocentricity. Atheism is not based on a commitment to reason. In many ways, it is its adversary. That's uh, page 17. And those are fighting words, Hamza. <laughs> um, I'm not saying they're wrong. They're just fighting words. Now, the question for you is, if I may, how serious a threat is atheism today, do you think? That's a very good question, Paul. Thank you for reading out the passage. I don't think atheism is a huge threat anymore. So there was a time where new atheism was a threat and it was kind of riding off the back of the kind of post 9-11 war on terror narrative mm. and you had the increase of a new form of liberalism and mixed with those type of atmospheric pressures if you like mm. it facilitated the likes of the four horsemen like Dawkins, Dennett, Harris and so on and so forth yeah but after a few years I think they lost their they lost their grounding and they, they lost their, their momentum. And the reason for that is because when you come across as extremely evangelical and you come across as misrepresenting the thing that you're attacking, that you're building straw men, and when you're basically jumping outside of your domain of expertise, for example, you may be a biologist, you may be a neuroscientist, and now you're delving into metaphysics and philosophy and theology, it's going to be just a matter of time that people are going to have enough and say, hold on a second, you're wrong here, you've misrepresented this, you built a straw man here, you're logically incoherent here, your reasoning doesn't follow here, and so on and so forth. And that happened over time. And I think with the likes of young, popular atheist YouTubers, they've even started to attack the new atheist movement as well. They, they did this a few years ago. So I think new atheism doesn't have that strength anymore and atheism in general i don't think it is as bad as what we would describe today as a new form of liberalism or even postmodernism. i think these things are far more damaging to the religious consciousness especially someone who would describe themselves as an orthodox muslim i think mm -hmm. liberalism and postmodernism and other isms yeah. that are similar are like they have this tsunami effect now they're trying to engulf the hearts and minds of believing folk but mm -hmm. in terms of the intellectual veracity of atheism 
with all due respect, I, I don't think it's that strong anymore. People have had enough of the straw man arguments, the evangelical type of atheism. And also, I think the reason for this as well is based on the fact that, you know, in the Islamic tradition, especially if you look at the various schools of creed, the, the three major schools of creed, the Ashra'ira, the Maturidis, the Asri tradition, they all have this concept of the fitra. And the fitra is basically the primordial state, the original state, the innate disposition. It's the kind of original, normative, innate disposition. Mm -hmm. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in an authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim, that every child is born upon the fitra, this innate state. And the fitra, the word itself, coming from the triliteral stem, fatara, which you have words like fatron and fatarahu. It's like something has been created within us to acknowledge the divine. Now, there are two main opinions in the classical tradition concerning the innate disposition. Mm. Irrespective of what position you take, it's still coherent with regards to what we're going to say today. And the first opinion is that the fitra has a form of primary knowledge or proto-knowledge. It's not knowledge in itself but it's more of an innate primary building blocks of knowledge and what is that knowledge that god exists that he's worthy of extensive praise and some scholars argue a sense of objective morality some objective morals mm -hmm. and what happens and you could use this metaphor which is based on the hadith that i mentioned before because the continuation of that hadith basically talks about the parents you know, vague, it doesn't, it doesn't use those words, but there's a kind of veiling or clouding of the fitra and the child moves away from the normative natural state. So you can use a metaphor of the fitra gets clouded and, you know, the whole point of life, the whole point of da'wah, the whole point of engaging with tradition, engaging with Muslims is that these things become ways to uncloud the fitra to awaken the truth that's already within every single human being mm. the other opinion is which i think echoes the opinion of i think the majority of the scholars including ibn Taymiyyah, although there is a debate but also al-ghazali known as the proof of islam the 11th century theologian and polymath they basically argued that the fitra doesn't have primary knowledge but it's like and I, i'm using this in contemporary language it's like a vehicle driving towards the truth and if the windscreen is clouded it cannot drive towards destination truth mm. so mm. our job or the job of life the job of the of the believer and the job of the person whose fitra is clouded is to ensure that that unclouding process takes place so the fitra could direct itself towards the truth now what that does is that really gives us a kind of picture of this natural state that everyone believes in some kind of creative agency in actual mm -hmm. fact one of the chapters in the book talk about the self-evident truth of the creative agency of god of the creator the underlying basic con concept of allah's creative agency god's creative agency is self-evidently true and there are some criteria to understand what are self-evident truths and this is not something that we just make up for the sake of it this mm -hmm. exists in western and eastern philosophy that there are some things that we accept as self-evidently true in other words true by default and the argument uh, we don't have to get into it now but the argument in that chapter basically articulates that the basic idea the fundamental idea of creative agency divine creative agency is self-evidently true and as you know when someone challenges the self-evident truth the onus of proof is on the one who's making the challenge yeah. now it doesn't mean what we consider to be self-evidently true now is always going to be the case but self-evident truths are true by default therefore if you're going to challenge it you need to provide a response a robust response mm -hmm. but the atheist the new atheist kind of argument is no you need to give us evidence for god's existence but i think we should turn the intellectual tables we should take center ring it's the center of the ring if you want to use a boxing analogy and say to them no in actual fact the onus of proof is on you because you're denying something that is conceptually self-evidently true so that's one thing and the other thing is there's lots of research as indicating obviously it's not conclusive but in the philosophy of religion in the psychology of religion rather even in, in cognitive science you have atheists and theists that are kind of displaying what you would call an affinity for 
agency and affinity for design. And there are so many different studies from a whole load of different researchers. In actual fact, the British Psychological Society, I think they're called the BPS, they basically made an interesting point and they said, essentially, atheists could, could see this as, for example, it could be explained by an atheistic worldview or a naturalistic worldview. But they said, but it's also true the other way. It could be explained that what's within us has been given to us by the divine to acknowledge him, which makes sense of the fitra. So it depends what lenses that you have. You can see the data as supporting, for example, a Darwinian paradigm, or it can also support, and I would even say strongly support, the kind of first principle position that we have, that theism is innate and it's natural. Now, I know I've been going too long, but I think it's very important to add that the Quran, from a primary facey point of view, doesn't really even address atheism directly. Right. Mm. So when you look at all the verses concerning Urububiya, Allah's creative agency, those verses are really there to get you to affirm his creative agency, to conclude something about yourself, something how you should something about how you should relate to Allah mm. and something about Allah. So in other words, it, it, something about yourself that you should be humble, how you should relate to Allah. You should worship him. You shouldn't associate partners with him. Something about Allah, he is one, he is powerful, he is all-knowing, he is wise. So you see this pattern in the Qur'an when Allah talks about verses concerning the natural phenomena and an expression of his creative power and agency, those verses are there to tell us something about ourselves, something about how we should relate to Allah, and something about Allah's uniqueness and power and names and attributes, Tawheed, affirming his oneness. Now, Re very rarely do you find anything directly attacking atheism, maybe in just two places directly. Don't get me wrong, these verses that I've just mentioned, there are many layers to them because ayat, the epistemic function of ayat, so the function of, uh, of the verses in the Quran referring to nature, their main function is to achieve a particular epistemic goal. But that epistemic goal can also be multi-layered. It's not just about the three things that I spoke about, it could you could infer evidences for God's existence. For example, if you go to the classical tradition, the early tafasir like Maturidi and others, you would see that they use this to actually develop an argument for God's existence, right? The contingency argument. But from a primary facey reading on the surface of it, there's hardly anything that directly attacks atheism apart from maybe chapter 52 verses 35 to 36 when Allah says, did you create yourself? Oh, yeah. Did you come from nothing? Did you create yourself? Did you create the heavens and the earth? Mm. Then you know, indeed, you don't have any certainty. So mm. from there, you could derive a really powerful argument that is Quranically based, but it's also very universal. And my one of my chapters in my book talks about the Quranic argument for God's existence and goes into detail. In actual fact, I've used the kind of underlying logic of these verses to some of the greatest atheist professors and thinkers in the world. And they haven't really come back with any what I would call an undercutting defeat, which shows how powerful the arguments of, of the Quran are. But don't get me wrong, the primary function of these verses are to agitate your fitra, to awaken your fitra, right? They're not there really for you to start thinking about theophilosophical arguments. No. Yes, you can do that. But the reason I'm saying this is because many people may not be they, just, they may not like philosophy on that level, or they may not feel that they have to go too deep into the subject because it's so self-evidently true. But this mm. is the power of the Quran, you see. The verses are like diamonds, right? No matter where, where, wherever you shine some light, you get a different color or refraction. Mm. You know, there's so many layers to the verses of the Quran. That's my point. So if someone was going to the kind of theo philosophical aspect, you could infer. If someone wants a kind of primary facey reading just to, you know, agitate the innate disposition and to mm. awaken it, you have something there, all mm. within the same set of verses as well. So I just wanted to make that point clear. So if you put all of this together from a psychological perspective, from a fitra perspective, from a theological perspective, from a Quranic perspective, I would argue that, you know, one of the reasons why atheism is not that strong is because it goes against this kind of mm. intuitive natural instinct, if you like, with this normative disposition that is not only 
true because we feel it, but it's also substantiated with very strong arguments as well. So I think, I know it's a very long answer to a short question, but I think atheism is not that much of a problem. And that's why many of the brothers who are online, I think mm -hmm. we're focusing on atheism too much. Right. I think there are great evils, if you like, or ideological challenges or worldview challenges that we need to start focusing on because we have to play the social intellectual chess game. And when you project five and 10 and 15 years into the future, you would see that atheism is not much of a problem. It's actually forms of liberalism and God forbid, even forms of postmodernism. Mm. Well, it's, it's, it's very interesting indeed. I think one of the, um, you mentioned atheism not being such a, a formidable uh, problem uh, as it has been uh, so far, but I think atheism has found um, a helpful ally in, in liberalism in, to this extent. The, 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 one of the axioms of our age, in the West at least, is the idea of the blank slate, that our human nature doesn't have this fitra at all. Um, and, th and this ultimately comes uh, uh, in terms of the genealogy of this idea, arguably goes back to a guy called John Locke. And I'm actually reading, <laughs> here we are, uh, one of his books at the moment, the second treatise. The Tabula Rasa. The tabula, exactly, that's what page one of, the, of this book, this idea of the blank slate. So John Locke was a, a, an English philosopher uh, based in, in Oxford and um, in the uh, 17th century, uh, a phenomenally brilliant uh, man. And he had a huge influence politically, uh, not least on the, the Constitution of the United States. He, uh, the founding fathers there uh, qu quite openly utilized his, his ideas uh, about government, uh, which I won't go into now. Uh, so his ideas are enduring and powerful, and they're very much dominant in the Western political order, but also philosophically, and that's the kind of point I want to address here. So he was an empiricist. So he believed we got our knowledge of the world that are through our sense perceptions, through our, our senses uh, uh, and within our, our, um, within our own thoughts, but they didn't, uh, ideas didn't generate, come, come from within in the Fitri sense. So it, it, I know you mentioned two different understandings of the fitra in the Islamic tradition. And the one understanding is the fitra does actually give you knowledge. It gives you a, uh, an apprehension, at least, of the divine and, and other things as well. I know it's uh, been elaborated considerably by I Ibn Taymiyyah and his work, extraordinary uh, thinker. Um, but Locke would deny this completely. And Locke's ideas are the dominant ideology now. Mm -hmm. And um, people like Steven Pinker, the professor of psychology at Harvard, has written powerfully against this, saying this idea is simply not scientific. You know, human beings do have a, a character. We do have a human. There is such a thing as human nature, he would argue. He does not argue for the future, of course. He's not a he's not a Muslim. He's an atheist, I think. But um, he, he's, he's arguing against the idea there is not even a human nature, which is what the blank slate thing implies. Um, so liberalism, uh, so atheism and liberalism there are, are, are useful kind of allies in that atheists can draw on this idea of the blank slate and say, look, we don't really have a human nature. We're kind of uh, purely social constructs and so on. But so and this is very subversive, is it not, of uh, uh, not only of uh, morality, of a human nature, but, but arguably of, of epistemology and has, has ramifications all over the place that Steven Pinker so coherently argues. Um, but I, I think the problem of liberalism today does have its a genealogy that goes back several centuries. <clears throat> and I think the way the Quran uh, and the, the Sahih Hadith men you mentioned speaks powerfully to the true nature of our condition that we do, we are designed by God, that we have a soul, we have consciousness, and our consciousness comes from the transcendent, and that we're not just, um, you know, byproducts of a DNA replicating animal evolutionary process, that there's much more going on than that. Um, and, and, and this kind of rings true for a lot of people. Um, and it's interesting, just if, if I may finally just say, um, there's an article here in the Times, uh, I've got a printout of it, um, which is headline, believe it or not, most atheists believe in the supernatural study finds. Mm. I think you might have referenced this. You know, but m most atheists, self-designated atheists, believe in supernatural powers, that there are forces of good and evil, according to an academic study uh, conducted in the UK. Thousands of people uh, who identify as atheists from the US, Brazil, China, Denmark, Japan, uh, were surveyed. Even they don't believe in God, most do believe in the supernatural. So even when we talk of atheists, there's a danger that many people might misunderstand what they're dealing with, that not every atheist is like Richard Dawkins, a materialist. Yes. Most atheists are not. 
many about 20 percent according to them according to 20 percent of atheists believe in life after death you know um you know i wouldn't normally call them atheists but they don't believe in god so there you go so um to, just moving on then to to liberalism liberalism is is therefore um has its roots in this lockean understanding of the tabula rasa um it uh, is atheistic in the implications, arguably. It doesn't reference a transcendent being. It doesn't talk about divine law. It doesn't talk about intelligent design. Um, and so even if it's not attacking Islam, it, it, in, the, the implication is, of course, that it's, it's wrong because it marginalizes or ignores Islam or, or belief in God in the way it talks about life. So how, what, what strategies do you think should we adopt to articulate the truth about the universe and god yes. uh, in the context of uh, a, a zeitgeist which is relentlessly secular and liberal in the way that you mentioned yeah i mean it's always fascinating listening to you paul honestly it's you you say a few words but there's a lot of substance and that shows that you read a lot and you think a lot so my love bless you for that so with regards to your point i just want to not unpack it, but just to reaffirm your point about everyone's, you know, atheists are not the same. In actual fact, Allah says it in the Quran in the third chapter, I think verse 113, that people are not the same, right? There are mm. upright, you know, Christians and Jews and so on and so forth. So there is a discussion, exegetical discussion of what that means, but generally speaking, we don't have this we don't have this idea of othering. And this is something that Dr. Osman Latif talks about in his book on being human which, you know, Islam, when you dealing with the individual, you individualize them, yes. right? You, you don't dehumanize them. You don't have this form of othering, which is very interesting. So when it comes to dealing with atheists on a one-to-one -one level, you need to listen with the intention to understand exactly. and seek their context because exactly. their atheism is not necessarily a denial of the supernatural creator. It mm. could be just a denial of, you know, a post-secular understanding of religion. Right, yes, and, and they may disbelieve in a god that Muslims disbelieve in as well. I mean, Absolutely. Be, in, in as far as they are rejecting God, may actually uh, not be in conflict with Islamic conception of God as Rahman or Rahim. So again, the target may not be Islam; it may be this uh, idea of a I don't know, a benign or fairly useless grandfather figure who dispenses, you know, gifts. <laughs> to his Absolutely. But completely powerless against earthquakes and cancer and so on and there's no answer to this oh no i'm an atheist i'm an atheist well yeah uh, we can see that but you know the true understanding of god is something else yeah for sure and that's why maybe the best question to really understand someone is to say well what kind of god don't you believe in exactly and exactly. And, and today some atheists would say well i don't believe a guy in the sky with a beard well <laughs> Congratulations, we're on the same page here because we believe in lace the chemically he shape. There is nothing like Allah, nothing like the divine. He's totally transcendent. He is Ahad, he is uniquely one. So, you know, there's a lot that, and that's why it requires a sense of emotional maturity to engage with people and to understand the particular context. So this is something that we talk about a lot in our Dawah training courses. We say, look, don't pre-frame the person. You know, if John hypothetical john comes to you on a dower table and says i'm an atheist don't start talking about science or thinking he's like richard dawkins this is totally wrong you have to listen with the intention to understand to seek his context and meaning because he may be the type of person that is rejecting god because of psychosocial reasons like for example when i had a discussion with professor ken james he's a scholar of nietzsche he's one of the leading scholars he became a professor in the uk without writing a book wow. and if you know about what it means to be a professor in the uk it's not like the us which is a little bit more easier right but in the uk <laughs> you have, yeah you, <laughs> you have to write a book he didn't write a book and he was a professor on nietzsche so he's a nietzschean scholar so what I learned a lot from him because I was at Queen Mary having a debate with him about deductive arguments and he was trying to respond. And then after the debate, he basically said to me, look, I, I want to know about your values, right? Because Nietzsche was also had a discourse about values. Yes. I want to know about your values because, and I want to know about, you know, why am I taking care of my, I think his son was 18 years old at the time. Why am I taking care of my disabled son for 18 years? And, and I just was taken aback thinking, 
Hamza, you're such an arrogant, you're so, you're so arrogant, right? I'm there talking about deductive arguments. Now, at that time, I had no academic qualifications, right? And although maybe some of the things I was saying was right in abstraction, but I lost him in the discussion because I wasn't listening with the intention to understand. And relatively recently, I was reading a book by Kate Murphy. I really recommend everyone to read it. There was a time where I stopped and nearly started crying. It's called You're Not Listening. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal book. Phenomenal book. And it reminds me of the kind of listening style and the psychology of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Truly having the intention to understand the person. Because once you do that, and you are committed to their well-being, and you want goodness and guidance for them, then you assess their particular context. And it might mean in their context that we just shut our mouths. Mm -hmm. Or it might mean we just buy them a pizza. Or it might mean we'll, we'll be like, you know what? I agree with you. Let's have a discussion on this or, you know, whatever, right? So mm -hmm. I think that that's a very important point that you've made. Uh, uh, so just to, uh, uh, slightly uh, off on a tangent here, and it's something that uh, often in Dawa, uh, when we talk to Christians, specifically Christians, uh, we know what Christians believe. So whenever we meet a Christian, we know they're Trinitarian, uh, Bible-believing Christians. Wrong. Um, survey after survey show, like in America, there's a survey recently of evangelical, self-designated evangelical Christians. Most do not even believe Jesus is God. Um, so we can't even assume, you know, that the obvious candidates are going to conform to our preconceived notions of what they should believe. And, and this speaks to what you, you've you just said. We need to listen to the individual and not assume we know, even when they have the label, we think we know what the label means. Because people are complicated. People are mm. not always what they appear to be. They may say, I am X, but actually they may not really be quite X. They're just saying that because people are people. We're humans. We're fallible. We we don't always, not always very clear. And, and that's a very basic point, which you have grasped brilliantly always in your Tao. And, and I met you and I've heard you speak about these things. But so often we, uh, others of us, don't do that. We have a, a, a identikit cardboard cutout template, which we plaster on people. So we label them X. Aha, my template, right, you're this. And then we launch into my, our dialogue, our diatribe, our polemics. And completely ignoring Mary or John or whatever yes. it is standing there in front of us. And, of course, th 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 their ego gets triggered because we're being quite egocentric in our approach. And it ends up being an argument. But do we ever win over the person? Very rarely. Um, and and your, your approach is much more uh, person-centered rather than cardboard cutout-centered. I'm not yeah. saying the arguments that Dawa people use are wrong about the Trinity. Uh, they're usually absolutely spot on. But it's the way they're deployed automatically when mm. person X comes along who calls himself a Christian. Well, actually, Christians are usually all over the place theologically. They're not usually clear like Muslims are about Tawheed, about you know this clarity that Muslims have. Christians don't have that. They're not. They're not like that, not that kind of animal. They're very different. They're complicated, inconsistent, and all over the place, and don't often know what they really believe. Whereas Muslims aren't like that, in my experience, and we kind of assume they are like that because, well, they're they're Christians. <laughs> um, but as you say, well, you know. You know not like that. You, yeah, you know, Paul. This is this is, a, and it's not just Muslims. It's humans today in general. There's a Korean-born German philosopher called Byung Byung Han Chul. I think his name is. He wrote a very interesting book called The Agony of Eros. It's a phenomenal. Like the way he writes is very concise, but there's lots to unpack. Mm. And he basically argues that we live in this kind of liberal secular narcissistic age mm. and in this and he did it in the context of love but it makes sense in other aspects of life and he says because we live in this narcissistic age because liberalism is the primacy of the individual mm. and right. what we do we don't consider the other anymore meaning we have alienated the other meaning there is someone other than ourselves with their own individuality and context and we've annihilated them and our kind of collective narcissism, what we do, we project ourselves onto the other mm -hmm. and we relate to them, but we're not relating to them, we're relating to our own projections of our own selves. Mm -hmm. And he argues that we don't know how to love anymore because mm -hmm. true love is to love the other, understanding their context, what makes them feel loved. You need to be committed to the other's well-being. You need to be committed to the other's guidance. But if the other now becomes just you, 
then all you're doing is relating to yourself. And it's like, and it was such powerful words that he put together. And, you know, I want you to do this video on that. We don't know how to love anymore. Because if you look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith, for example, the hadith literature are very contextual. Like for one person, there was a certain way of relating. For another person, another way of relating. And when you unpack the psychology, you're like, subhanAllah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is, I believe there is a consensus, there's no doubt about this. When he is a rahmah, when he is a mercy to the world, he was totally committed to the goodness and guidance of all people. And that's mm -hmm. why he was sent. And in that commitment, he would relate to people in their context to try and get the best out of them. For example, you have Fudala ibn Umar. He was the person who nominally became Muslim. He was circum circumambulating the Kaaba and he wanted to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet noticed this and he basically said, what are you saying to yourself? And I think Fudala ibn Umar kind of reacted. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put his hand on his heart Mm -hmm. And said, ask Allah for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And Fudala ibn Umar, after that point, said, you know, after that moment, no one was more beloved to me than the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you see, the language that the person would, would, would use for a particular person in their context and his body language was optimal to get the best out of that particular person. Mm -hmm. And you see this in different scenarios. For example, you see it in the son of the famous Jewish man who pulled him by the collar or the neck, left right. a mark because he owed him some money. And the Prophet wasallam responded with hell, with forbearance, because mm -hmm. we know a sign of prophethood mm -hmm. from the, the Jewish person's perspective. He wanted to see, you know, a prophet, if he's going to be a prophet, he's going to respond to aggression and evil with what is more beautiful, what is more virtuous. And he saw two of the signs, he was waiting for this sign, and he saw it in the Prophet and he became a Muslim. And this echoes, for example, one of the most famous and beautiful verses in the Quran in chapter 41, verse 34, good and evil are not the same, repel by that which is better. And if there's any, any enmity between two people, we turn to intimate friendship. And what's interestingly interesting, the Arabic word repel is not followed by a direct object. It doesn't say repel evil, it's like repel anything. And by which it, that which is better. And the ulama, the scholars say that which is better is what is more virtuous and, and what is more beautiful. But mm -hmm. I just want to echo the point about John Locke. And mm -hmm. double check this for me, Paul, right, in your readings. John Locke was heavily influenced by Edward Pocock. Edward Pocock was considered the first Orientalist. Yeah. Edward Pocock learned a lot from yeah. the East. He would yep. take Arabic manuscripts. Mm. And what's very interesting, John Locke would want to study and was learning from Edward Pocock. And Edward Pocock, I think, transmitted into Locke in some way. And this is kind of inferential. But he, he gave him the idea of governance being a vicegerency. Now, Ed, uh, John Locke actually mentions this type of um, ethic with regards to governance. It's a vicegerency. Mm. I want you to translate vicegerency into Arabic. It's yes. khilafah. <laughs> you just found directly in the Quran in that very sense. Yes. Absolutely. So you're a caretaker, you, you have an authority, and so on and so forth, which is very, very interesting about the cross cultural, the cross uh, intellectual fertilization if you if you want to use such language right because it's very very interesting yeah, with regards regards to when when you and i met uh, in istanbul is islam and the english enlightenment the untold story by uh zulifak al ali shah i've not read the book it's waiting for me to touch once i finish reading some more john Locke. but I, I happen to know that he argues exactly what you're you're saying th 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 this has been airbrushed out the islamic contribution or the influence uh on uh, the English Enlightenment, i.e. people like John Locke and, uh, and others, uh, is profound. And uh, we don't know about it anymore because it's been quietly airbrushed out of our own history. And so you get the other the othering of Muslims when they arrive in the UK. But in fact, th their faith has already profoundly influenced the, the intellectual uh, tradition in this country, but we no longer know it. So, you know, we've created a problem that needn't be. Yes. So mm. with regards to... I mean, the arguments in my book in general, obviously people are free, the, it's freely downloadable 
uh, from the Sapiens Institute website. They could also get it from Amazon. Now, these arguments, when you see, when you study philosophy, you see, when you go into postgraduate work, you know, I've done a master's, I've done an MRes as well, I did a master's in research and philosophy, and now I'm doing a PhD. When you get into these nuances, you could split the philosophical hair as many times as you want. You could be as skeptical as you want. You can try and find arguments for and against. And I am a, I am a believer that we need to try and keep it as simple as possible, but also to retain some intellectual veracity. And I believe, based upon the stuff that I mentioned previously about it being self-evidently true and the natural disposition and so on and so forth, I believe that there is a kind of limit to the theological philosophical discussions we can have because there is a limit that if you go beyond that limit then it becomes what i'll call if uh, it's it becomes dysfunctional intellection because take for example the philosophy of the mind you know i write about consciousness and the hard problem in the book the hard problem of consciousness you know how can we have a world according to the philosophical naturalists how can we have a world that you know we just have physical processes that are blind and and cold and non-rational blind meaning there's no intentional force behind them and cold meaning they're not aware of themselves aware of anything outside of themselves this is what the philosophical naturalist sees this is the first you know principle the lens that they put on their eyes to understand reality physical stuff physical processes are just basically blind and cold no intentional force behind them and they are not aware of themselves or aware of anything outside of themselves. So how can you have a human being with the ability to have rational insights, the human being that has inner subjective conscious experience, how can you have that as a result of blind, cold physical processes? And obviously, I get into much more detail, but even if you go in even further and further and further and you go down the philosophical rabbit's hole or the lizard hole, if you like, to, to use yeah. Islamic terminology, it gets so nuanced and, and kind of blurry that there is a limit to this type of discourse. And I argue that if you have a robust enough argument that makes sense, and in order for someone to try and challenge your argument, they have to go into this level of skepticism or this area of academia that only maybe three people on the planet can really understand, then you've got a good argument. And that's why I want people to be cautious here because I don't want them to fixate their theism just purely on abstract intellectual arguments and they have to be so robust because everyone has different levels of understanding. Mm -hmm. And this echoes the whole journey of Al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali made a beautiful point. He basically argued that don't rely your conviction purely on carefully produced premises and a conclusion. Because someone smarter than you, and there's someone always going to be smarter than you, can basically play around with your premises and your conclusion may change. Iman is bigger than that. Yes, you have intellectual veracity. Iman is not just blind faith. It's not blind faith at all, actually. It means to feel secure. It's based on spiritual, intellectual grounding and conviction but we have to also understand that there's more to it than that, that it's not just abstract intellectual arguments, but there is a process, there's a phenomenological thing going on, a first-person experience, there's an existential thing going on, where you, you actually, you know what, John, it's like, sorry, you know what, Paul, it's like tasting a sweet mango. If I had a sweet mango, and I'm the only person in my environment to have that sweet mango, if everyone around me said, that mango is not sweet. Here is a logical argument. Here is a deductive argument. With all due respect, I would laugh at them, yeah? Because I've actually experienced that sweet mango. I, so I, what I, I need to do is to share that sweetness with them. And yeah. so Islam has to be that too. You have to have that process of internalizing the religion, understanding why Allah is worthy of worship. Because one of my favorite chapters in my book is chapter 15, which is about, it's called the free slave. It's got around seven arguments of why Allah is worthy of worship, which is essential to our deen. And I truly believe if people go on that journey, they affirm Allah's names and attributes, they understand why he's worthy of worship, and they manifest that in their life as a way of being, what's in their heart, how they speak and how they relate to themselves, how they relate to others and how they relate to Allah, 
there's going to be and 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 at the same time they have good arguments as well when that all meshes together then you have some very strong conviction so i don't want people to be fixated on this kind of modern discourse of we're like ai machines you're going to type in our algorithm you're going to expect mm -hmm. you know certain results intellectual results or results concerning faith it just doesn't work that way and this by the way is not a cop out this echoes modern cognitive science because mo modern cognitive science argues that people think they're rational and they may have a rational position by an actual fact mm -hmm. it's driven by psycho emotive factors of often the case so, yeah. yeah i was i was just thinking about you know, ghazali's uh, experiential certainties it's not just an intellectual because you always find you say someone who's brighter than you and i was rem reminded of the there's an incredible number of peer reviewed uh, uh research i was reading a, a paper at the moment by uh, an american physician who attends people who are, are the, at the final stage of their lives uh, and some of them uh, who have near-death experiences and other out-of-body experiences uh, and th this is very well documented now you get people who are born blind people who are born deaf who uh, in a very extreme situation of near death, or they've had a, a catastrophic heart attack or uh, a coma and so on, uh, suddenly find themselves outside of their bodies, looking down upon themselves whilst the emergency services are feverishly trying to revive them. And successfully, of course, in these cases, because the people who are then revived, uh, if they are deaf or blind in this instance, are they are then able to recount accurately what they saw and heard? And yes. there are many cases like this. There's a there's a, an academic paper produced by the University of Minnesota on the Library of Congress website, no less. I've seen it, where where they've been through these these uh, instances, and go through the different arguments. Well, what can explain this phenomena? What natural, medical, neurological, and they've not found anything uh, terribly persuasive, other than the self-reported. In other words, the Ghazalian sense of uh, this person knows that they that they have left their bodies. They know there is no longer any fear of death for these people because they have transcended that. They've crossed over in a way and come back again. But but the empirical uh, third person uh, independent um, corroboration of this is now available in the you know the the neuro the, uh, you know the doctors and the nurses who attend who. who uh, 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 who are then spoken to by these patients? They said, "I heard you say this. I saw you do this. But how is that possible? You're blind. You're you're deaf. But you're right. We did say that. We did do that. And we cannot deny that. What do you do with that phenomena? And because this is now seeping into the popular consciousness, particularly the United States, where this where this literature is very widely available and online on YouTube, people are getting the idea that the materialist scientific narrative is not." quite right it you know yeah it, it gives us computers yes it helps us to fly to places yes it can give us cars and whatever but in these other areas there's mystery there's something really interesting going on and religion actually has already been there and it tells us the quran tells us that there is there is an afterlife and so you know there's an interesting overlap now occurring i think yeah, for sure. I mean, near-death experiences, I've been always fascinated. I, wrote, I read a book by this Dutch heart surgeon, I think his name was Van Pimmel. Yeah. And uh, that was some very fascinating research. And that opened the door to other research that I was trying to uh, capture and understand. And if you are open-minded and rational, you cannot help but come to the conclusion that there is no naturalistic explanation or mm. scientific explanation to explain someone who is supposedly brain dead, mm. someone who has their eyes closed, someone who may not have any brain activity, someone who is blind and can recall things that actually happened that have been verified by multiple it's witnesses verified. beyond any kind of discussion. It is opinion. literally impossible, and yet it happens so therefore we have to argue i would argue revise our paradigms we need to move beyond the materialist paradigm to consider other paradigms uh, non or what i would call post materialist paradigms uh, you know get, give it a bit of jargon uh, and and this course opens us up in, in an interesting way to faith it was up to uh, what the scriptures say and the scriptures speak very eloquently of this and the information is already there we will find scriptures meeting us on this journey we don't have to kind of wander around aimlessly wondering what's going on sure there is a pathway and and what's interesting as well is it's this is not belittling the scientific method because the scientific method has been hijacked by some of these materialists because remember materialism is a metaphysic it's like a lens that you put on your eyes to under it's the first principle on how to understand reality philosophical naturalism is a metaphysic it's a 
first principle. It's a lens. It's a primary position that they use to understand the world. Now, the scientific method, generally speaking, yes, there's some arguments, but generally speaking, is quite metaphysically neutral from that perspective, right? It's a limited method that tries to understand the physical world. Hmm. We make inferences from that. So, for example, take neuroscience. Mm. Neuroscience as a domain of scientific study, and I mentioned this in the book, I believe, concerning consciousness, can is a, is a science of correlations, yeah? You right. see some neurochemical firing, some electrochemical activity, and you correlate it to certain experiences or certain movements or whatever the case may be. So it's a really a science of of correlations. In, in other words, was like one uh, neuroscientist said, it's pixelated phrenology. Yeah. Oh, it's I a like pixelated, it's, it's, yeah. pixelated phrenology. I like that. Yeah. yeah. It, it's like a pixelated understanding of the brain because we don't know, we don't know that much. Yes, we're improving, but we don't know that much concerning kind of subjective consciousness aspects of, of the brain. So, you know, you know, take the hard problem of consciousness as an example. The hard problem of consciousness is generally misunderstood. They think it's about what is it like to be Hamza. No, it's more than that. It's based on two key questions. And I want to elaborate in the following way. Let's go back to the mango that I spoke about. So I'm eating this mango. So I'm having a, an inner subjective experience of tasting this sweet mango. Okay. Mm. So that's the first part. The first part is, what is it like for Hamza to have this mango in this moment? Okay. That's the first question. So there is what you call an epistemic gap. Can someone other than Hamza know what it's like for Hamza to have that sweet mango? That's the first point. Second key point or question is, well, how and why does Hamza have an inner first person subjective experience mm -hmm. arising from seemingly cold, blind physical processes. So there's an ontological question. So you have an epistemic question, ontological question. So some people are trying to address the first question, the epistemic question. Yes, we know what it's like for Hamza to have that mango because he can describe it. Sweet, tasty, soft, delicious. But these are words and words are vehicles to meaning and meaning in this context is an echo or representation or a mirror of that subjectivity. So you have to assume that the words that Hamza is using is representing a subjectivity that is identical to yours. You can't assume that, right? You can't, you know. you, the you, other you way of... Very simple. No one can assume that my experience, and make it really, really simplistic here, my experience of a patch of pink is the same as your experience of a patch of pink. We, we, the, 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 we, we, the physiology may be the same, but this inner experience of this very simple reality may be completely different. Or, or my yes. experience of a sound is just like your experience of a sound, even though the objectively the sound is a clock ticking. But my experience of it, my perception, my inner uh, apprehension of that, we can't just assume that it's the same for individual to individual. The subjectivity may be different and we can't. So even though the external trigger may be the same, the, the physics of it, the apprehension may be different. And, and this is, yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, no, no, I agree. Now the, the neuroscientific rule would be, ha, huh, but we can map out his electrochemical activity when he's having that sweet mango, we can see the neurochemicals firing. Now, there is an assumption here. The assumption is that the same neuro, neuro electrochemical activity is happening every time I have the sweet mango, and it's never the case. That's never the case, yeah? But even if that were to be the case, mm. well, all you have is neurochemicals firing. How can you infer knowledge of my inner subjective experience? Right. So it's correlation, <laughs> not causality. You can't know that A causes B simply because A and B happen concurrently. Even yeah. if it were to cause, in this in the question of the epistemic question, even if it were to cause the subjectivity, my inner subjective conscious state, it doesn't follow now, you know what it's like for me to be in that state right. just by looking at electrochemical activity. Right. Right. So that's the first question. The second question is the thing that I spoke about a bit earlier. Well, according to the kind of a physicalist universe or philosophical naturalism or materialism, and these words in the philosophy of the mind, physicalism and materialism are used synonymously. They have different histories, but they're generally used in the same sense, mm -hmm. which basically means that consciousness can be reduced to, in some way, to physical processes or material stuff. Now, what's very interesting about the ontological question is, well, we have a brain, 
that is kind of reduced to electrons whizzing around. And we have a universe and a micro universe, the human being, that is reduced to, to physical processes. According to the physicalist or materialist, physical processes are blind. There's no intentional force driving them anywhere. And they are cold, meaning they're not aware of themselves or aware of anything outside of themselves. And this is known in the philosophy of the mind as intentionality, yeah, in a technical sense. So how can you have inner, this first person fact, you can't deny that you're having inner subjective conscious experiences. How can that come from blind, cold physical processes? That would be the equivalent of taking a blind, cold stone, rubbing it really hard, and butterflies emerging, right? Mm -hmm. So one would argue that all the forms of physicalism, like eliminative materialism and reductive materialism and emergent materialism, the strong and the weak version and functionalism, these are not adequate explanations. Now, one would argue, and this goes back to the scientific thing, yeah? So I'm, I'm squaring the circle, yeah? The neuroscience, what would I do? What about neuroscience? When we know everything about the brain, we could solve the hard problem. No, no, no. It is well known amongst the neuroscientists and the philosophers of the mind, like Moderato, Monzati, and others. They argue that neuroscience has physicalist assumptions. It has a physicalist metaphysic. It has to assume that consciousness can be reduced to just electrochemical activity, even subjective uh, uh, subjective consciousness which is also known as qualia in neuroscience or in the philosophy of the mind is known as ph ph uh, phenomenal experience yeah so uh, you can't say that neuroscience would answer the question because it already assumes a physicalist ontology mm -hmm. so if it assumes a physical ontology and if, and physicalism as a Metaphysic as an ontology can't explain the, uh, the hard problem of consciousness. How on earth would neuroscience do that? And let's just give you another basic example. If we were to put, you know, probes on your brain, Paul, and map out every single possible electrochemical activity and correlate to every kind of experience that you have, it still does not follow. We know what it's like for you to have those experiences, mm -hmm. and it doesn't follow that we now can explain how you have inner subjectivity arising from seemingly cold, blind physical processes. And, and this is interesting, this is a complete, uh, almost a random point here. I, mean, I, I agree with what you're saying, but th those, those folk who, uh, e even atheists, near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences happen to anyone. They could be atheist or Christian or whatever. It doesn't seem to matter what their religion is. Uh, I say these are very well documented. This is not kind of um, hearsay. This is becoming a hard, a hard science, so to speak. But one of the problems these people have or have these experiences is when they get better and they go home and they tell their friends and their family about what happens to them, if their family members uh, are disposed to be quite materialist or physicalist in their assumptions about reality, then they do not welcome what their, their loved one says. And, and they can't, this ca has caused friction in families and even, wow. even arguments. As, as I say, I'm reading a book by a physician who uh, has followed these case studies up. And it doesn't always happen, but it does happen uh, quite frequently. And it's very sad because loved ones uh, who have not had this experience just don't get it. They don't, well, what do you mean you had an out-of-body experience? Um, it's not possible. You're, you're, you're hallucinating. You're, you're just crazy. And so and this is really hurtful because this person has had a really impactful, life-transforming experience, which to them is the most real thing that's ever happened to them. It's much more real than this world. It, it, it has a, a transcendent uh, and enduring impact often transforming them for the better. Um, and it's often quite religious as well. And so it, it's not a, it, it's something that's often not welcomed. And we, and we, I mean, I remember when I was doing philosophy at uni, doing philosophy of mind, and, uh, you know, consciousness was seen as a, um, a byproduct of, of the physical brain. And we were yeah. worrying, about how do we apprehend a patch of pink? And how is this possible? Oh, this is so reductionist. It's so materialist. And I, I almost wanted to scream Barclay at people, you know, who's the idealist philosopher. Let's let's go into some idealism straight away, please. For some <laughs> um, but that didn't happen so quick, but it did in the end. But, um, but you know, on the, just because it might be print, yeah, I'm going to preempt people's thinking now. You know, theists and atheists would say, hold on a second, but if you damage the brain, you damage your consciousness. Yes, but again, that doesn't now follow they're both yeah. the same things from an inner subjective conscious point of view. And I like to bring that analogy of the driver in the car. Mm -hmm. So you have a driver in the car and say the car is like the brain and the driver is consciousness or in a subjective 
you know, phenomenal experience, conscious experience. And if the car is not working, then even if the driver's, you know, functioning, the, it's not going to go anywhere. Mm. And the opposite is true. If the driver is not functioning, and but the car's functioning, it's not going to go anywhere either. So they need each other, mm. but it doesn't mean that they are exactly identical in the same thing. And that's something that's very important too, because I always hear this kind of outdated cliche, oh, but if you just, if you, you know, you know, damage the frontal lobe, you're going to change your behavior. Yeah, we, no one disagrees with that, yeah. And that's why I like to advocate what I think uh, Professor Talia Alfaro ad advocates. So there's, there's, there's a modern defense for a form of dualism. I'm not saying Islam has to be adopting a kind of uh, form of dualism, but he calls an integrative dualism, which is very interesting. And he says, look, you can accept all the uh, neuroscience. And as Muslims, we accept science. But... The neuroscience that tries to encroach on the metaphysics, mm. which is not really neuroscience, to be honest, but mm. that you just leave it to your metaphysical paradigm. And our metaphysical paradigm is we accept that there are physical things happening. This is a manifestation of Allah's irada and qudra and manifestation of his will and power. And we accept the scientific method to explain those things. But there are things that are outside of the scope of the neuroscientific enterprise, which is based on first principles of metaphysics, which we're going to adopt from an Islamic perspective. And it's an integrated type of uh, dualism yeah. where you top down, accept it. Well, it's top down as well as bottom up because the material is yes. bottom up, generating from the, the, the particles. But the top down, this is a, a language from John Polkinghorne, the, the physicist, is, is where you have a, a more idealist conception, whether it be our consciousness or God himself, who, who directly intervenes and changes things. So that you get this, this interconnected, multidimensional, or what you call holistic reality, rather than everything yes. being drained down to a, 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 a materialist paradigm, which is a philosophical prejudice. It's not, I mean, I remember I asked a, an atheist recently, at Speaker's Corner of all places, because uh, he, he said that, uh, matter is all that there is. The universe is, is made of materials, material substance, and that's all there is. I said, fine, what is the scientific evidence for that? Can you present me the scientific evidence for that? What's the proof of that, please? And of course, he didn't wasn't able to answer that, or he wouldn't admit he was able to. He, he kind of gave me uh, answers which really didn't connect with the question at all, and I had to kind of point that out. Uh, but of course, there are no scientific reasons why materialism is true, because that itself is a worldview which is not yes. justified by science. You know, the existence of the universe is a presupposition. The existence of the efficacy of reason is a presupposition. The existence of the orderliness and the laws of physics is a presupposition. It's not an evidence. It's something that is a, a prerequisite to doing yeah. science at all. And this is interesting, Paul, because, you know, I argue in the book that atheism is an intellectual mirage. It's, it's irrational because if you think about it, you know, as you just pointed out with your experience at Hyde Park, that you have people who have certain positions and they think the positions are scientific but in actual fact they're very philosophical they're metaphysical they're metaphysical like there is no such thing as any idea that is metaphysically free that is philosophically free every postulation idea has a metaphysic or a kind of philosophical assumption and some philosophical assumptions on metaphysic uh the metaphysics they are coherent and you can ground them, others you can't, they're incoherent. Mm. So it was very interesting the way you posted it to the person, well, where's your scientific evidence for materialism? Uh, yeah. Well, you know, he, he can't argue that because now he's arguing for a philosophical principle or well, a first yeah, principle or a metaphysic. If you want to know what he said, I mean, it's a bit, it's a bit embarrassing. I'm not, I haven't told who it is, I'm not ridiculing him. He said, well, you know, uh, sci science works because we, we can measure things and, and, and we can quantify things. I'm thinking, yes, that's all true, but that wasn't my question. Mm. What is, so he, he hadn't quite grasped that I was asking a philosophical question. What, what is the scientific evidence that the material substance is all that there is? And he danced around it, but never quite connected. And I gave up in the end because, well, I just did. I had to. But, uh, uh, well, but Paul, uh, what's interesting yeah. is when they argue just it works, therefore it's yeah. true. Yeah. That's also doesn't logically follow because right. there's been many things that have worked in science, but we later found out that they were not true. Mm -hmm. So even this thing that this kind of approach that, yeah, it works, so therefore it must be true, is actually not even a really robust argument anyway. But mm -hmm. coming to the point of reason, so atheists would postulate that they're rational, that they have reasons to reject God, or that they are the kind of 
you know, cognitively superior from the perspective that we're not going to believe in these medieval arguments and we're rational. Now, what's very interesting, the whole idea of reason and logic and valid inferences and a deductive argument and having rational insights, all of that is required before you do any science. Like you need maths and you need logic and you need, you know, logical uh, relations to exist or you, you affirm them before you do any science. The whole scientific enterprise is predicated, dependent upon our ability to have rational insights. So mm. I go in kind of depth into it, but generally speaking, if you adopt a kind of materialistic or philosophical naturalistic position that physical processes are blind and cold, there's no intentional force behind them, they're not aware of themselves or aware of anything outside of themselves, mm. then mm. how can you explain our ability to reason? And I give this example of two examples, right? Two taxi drivers. The first taxi driver, he's blindfolded and he has two passengers, premise number one and premise number two, like premise <laughs> number one and premise number two. They go in the back and they say to the taxi driver, take me to, I don't know, Buckingham Palace. The taxi driver is not, he's not only blindfolded, the taxi driver is dead, right? He's cold and blind, right? It's like physical processes. The taxi driver is not going to take any of these premises anywhere. Because what we do when we reason, we take premises or positions and we take them on a mental journey. We have this rational insight. We have logical relations. A logical relation is not a physical thing, right? And the second uh, example is, well, you have premise number one and premise number two. They go into the taxi. He's got 20-20 vision. And he is fully conscious and alert. And they they ask him, can you go to Buckingham Palace? And now he can use his you know, awareness and the fact that he can see and take them to the destination. I say that theism is the second example. Philosophical naturalism, this form of atheism, is the first example. Um, and that's why I say, you know, some forms of atheism are intellectual mirage because many atheists unfortunately not all of them as we already said but a lot of them a substantial amount especially in the online world and in academia but not all of them of course they are philosophical naturalists now they may not adopt the hat or the badge but if you ask them do you believe in the divine they say no if you ask them do you believe in the supernatural they'll say no and if you ask them do you believe that everything can be explained by or reduced to in some way to physical processes they would say yes and well, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of them do. And then when you attack that form of atheism, you'd be like, well, this is an intellectual mirage. Because how can you now justify your ability to reason? And yes, it goes into much more detail. There's things like evolutionary reliabilism and there's arguments for and against. And the book kind of indicates that. But from an intuitive and rational point of view, how can we even allow the atheists to assume they could enter the house of reason, right? They don't even have the key. They've got the wrong key, right? Because well, you, you go further than that. Okay, you, you establish that intellectually that they don't have the key to enter the house in the first place. But you go further. You talk about um, the the conditions that facilitate the denial of the divine are not only based on false assumptions about incoherent arguments and pseudoscientific postulate. You've already demonstrated that. But that they veil emotional issues, you say, and on occasion ego ec eccentricity. In other words, you, you're saying that there are psychological, deep psychological reasons or motives behind their denial of uh, God. So could you speak to, how come you say that? What's your evidence for that extraordinary claim? Yeah, that is an extraordinary, an ex extraordinary claim. I actually believe that to be the case based on two things. Right. And this is from my experience. I spent like maybe over 15 years dealing with like many, 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 many different people, many, many, many atheists. And I've come to the conclusion that when I deal with people who have left Islam or people who have become atheists, and this is my experience, I'm not saying it's like, you know, a valid statistical, you know, inference that I'm making, but if you count the number of people that I've dealt with, I've seen this pattern and it's phenomenal. Around 80% of the people that I deal with, when they reject the divine or leave Islam, they may come across as having some kind of intellectual argument. But when you listen with the intention to understand, you discuss with them, 
it comes down to a form of traumatic experience or they have given the wrong meaning to a particular event in their life or to a particular relationship or a particular experience. Mm. And our job is to get them to stand in the possibility that the meaning that you have given this experience or relationship or event is not the only meaning. And we try to give them the meaning that Allah wants them to give them, which would empower them and basically, you know, free them from the shackles of their own um you know, negativity, if you like. I'll give you an example. You know, I was having a discussion with someone who was doing the algorithm for Facebook. And in the beginning, we were talking about consciousness, lo and behold. And I think that's when I just finished my master's and I was my master's thesis was on, on that, type, that type of topic. And he was talking about AI, artificial intelligence. And he said, you know, artificial intelligence, and this was just a general conversation, we didn't get into the crux of the matter at that time. He said, artificial intelligence can be fully conscious like a human being. I said, oh, that's very interesting. And I talked about Professor John Sell's Chinese Room experiment. I talked about the difference between strong AI and weak AI, weak AI, the difference between syntax and semantics, and so on and so forth. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I asked him during the course of the conversation, you know, why do you reject Allah? What was, what's the problem here? And he basically said that, I reject Allah because Allah has human names and attributes, right? So I'm like, hold on a second. This is like Islam 101. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, uh, Allah is transcendent. There is nothing like him. In actual fact, the Arabic, there is no ka as mithil, his ex a thing over his example. It doesn't say there is nothing like Allah. It's like a linguistic ploy to say you can't even compare to an example of Allah, mm -hmm. right? Which is like a compounded transcendence, if you like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So laser ka mithlihi shape, right? So I think that we believe in 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 transcendence, and yes, we affirm God's names and attributes, but we affirm the transcendence and the maximal perfection, that to the highest degree possible. You we don't compare them to human beings, those attributes to human attributes. That'll be a form of humanization, and we don't compare human attributes to God. That'll be a form of deification. This is what is known as associationism, shirk, and so on and so forth. I, I said stuff like that, but then I realized something. And I get this a lot when I interact with people. And we have something at Sapiens called Lighthouse Mentoring Service where we do with like, you know, thousands, over a thousand people so far, or, you know, a thousand hours mentoring on, on, on these type of issues. And you get this, you get to understand that they get to contradict themselves. And when there is a logical contradiction that they haven't realized, it's usually an indication of something else that's going on. Mm -hmm. And I realized there was a contradiction. He was happy for the AI machine to be fully conscious. In other words, the, the creation of the human, in this context, the creator of the AI, right? The AI could have the attribute of its creator, the human, but he wasn't happy with the human to have the attribute of its creator, Allah. Mm -hmm. And we're not saying it's the same, but say even linguistically or even a kind of a, a, a kind of quasi, uh, yani, um, Let's focus on uh, the, the language, like God is our Rahman, the most merciful, and we could be merciful too from a human perspective. So there's that kind of linguist, linguistic similarity. Yes, we affirm total difference and God's transcendence, but why is he happy with the first scenario, not happy with the second scenario? Mm -hmm. That's a logical contradiction. The door swings, logical door swings both ways. So mm -hmm. when I realized that, I mentioned it to him and I kind of saw his mouth drop. And then I wanted to be sensitive to his context. So I spoke about my relationship with my father when I became a Muslim and how I fixed that because it was my drama and so on and so forth. And I kind of subtly said, maybe that could be the case with you. And I'm telling you, he was a softly spoken, you know, he was a, you know, a big guy and he stood up shaking. He even said, this is the emotional abuse. He was crying. Wallahi, you Paul, it's as if I pressed a button and something happened, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, Lord Ahmed was actually in the room with me, right? Because we were doing it together. So, I have a witness, right? And we had to calm him down and bought him some food, changed the subject. To cut a long story short, his mother informed us after that he had uh, huge problems with father figures mm -hmm. and that he was actually working on rectifying that. Right. Now, this is one example of a many, Paul. Allah has blessed me with these experiences that... Oh, continuously, I have these experiences where Allah is like giving me a sign, right? 
there's another experience with with this so, guy so, who, before, you, before you go ahead i mean do you, do you think the opposite for a second so if, if a person comes to faith and they experience serenity and peace and love towards neighbor and a love towards god who's going to attribute that to a traumatic childhood who's going to say oh well you just had a really bad experience that's why you're a loving person i mean it doesn't fit it's that these are manifestations of wholeness of well-being yes absolutely you say absolutely. it goes both ways it doesn't actually you know so a religious person who has these manifest these qualities but of course are praised in in, in and, and uh, encouraged in islam is the atheists can't come along and do the similar kind of uh, etiology that you've done because wholeness and well-being and, and integration are not signs of disorder they don't agree whereas what you're saying atheism does in these instances yeah so now th one would argue but yeah but i i believe islam is not true and have arguments against it but the thing is when someone has this type of psycho emotive experiences that have been negative they would use intellectual arguments to try and justify that. And remember, this echoes modern cognitive science as well. People think they're rational, but it's driven by psycho-emotive factors. Mm. Whereas the believer who hasn't had those negative uh, emotional or psycho-emotional experiences, they may have the same doubts, but they have the cognitive spiritual architecture intact to be able to deal with those doubts effectively. Mm. Whereas one person who hasn't got that cognitive emotional spiritual architecture in place it's crumbled mm. when they have those intellectual doubts they'll hold on to them mm. and this is the nature of what you call in the islamic spiritual tradition the shubuhat shubuhat is the plural for shubha which is the destructive doubt and in islamic psychology which is which is very kind of echoing what's happening now in cognitive science we have something called the qalb the heart and the qalb this taqallub it wavers qalba, to boil over and the 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 qalb, it it it's it, its function. One of its functions is the aql, the intellect. According to the majority of the scholars, the aql, the intellect, is the function of the qalb. So the qalb wavers, right? And it has the aql. The heart also has shubuhat and shahawat, meaning destructive doubts and blameworthy desires. And it has what you call diseases of the heart. The four main spiritual diseases include vanity, urjub. Ria, ostentation, kibber, arrogance, and hasad, blame with the jealousy. And there's many others, but these are the four main ones. Mm. So the heart has, you know, these tribulations of blame with the desires and destructive doubts, and it has these diseases. So even if you have solid intellectual arguments, the aql is functioning fine, but it's part of a heart that may be diseased. Mm. And if it's diseased because of negative experiences or because of ego or because mm. of blame with the jealousy or because of arrogance or because it's trying to, you know, fixate itself too much on blame with the desires, then the arc of the intellect is not going to be doing its job properly or it's not going to be functioning coherently within the whole kind of architecture of what we call the qalb, the spiritual focus, which is the focus of, you know, uh, who we are as humans and also the, inter the, the, the intellect itself. Yes, there's many other debates on, you know, where does the mind come involved? That's a diff I'm not an Islamic psychologist, but the point is, just by understanding this basic stuff concerning who we are as humans, we have the qalb, it wavers, it has destructive doubts, it has blame with the desires, it has diseases, the aql, the intellect is a function of that, and we have a fitra as well, an innate disposition, and we have a ruh, we have a nafs, all of these things are dynamic interplay, we have a body as well, the body affects our our nafs as well, we know this from the hadith literature, when the person would have this like hot oat body drink and he said it soothes his soul so an external physical thing affecting the body can have a psycho it's a psychosomatic effect right so you know wallahi both the if anyone studies you know islamic psychology even from a very kind of basic level they'll see something amazing going on and then you'll be like it's not just about abstract intellectual arguments but rather there's something else going on it's connected to the color but it's connected to diseases of the heart it's connected to shahawat blame with the desires and so on and so forth which echoes cognitive science today mm. now in that context when someone's spiritual architecture i use that term right you know the heart is not wavering too much they don't they're not really infected with too many diseases it's not on that level that's it's created a big infection spiritual infection you know they, they don't have too many destructive doubts then when they have uh, intellectual things going on it's going to function appropriately it's going to mm -hmm. function more coherently and it's going to be more as part of that natural way of being now if someone for example has been infected with too many blameworthy desires it's 
even if the intellect is fine, it's not going to work. It's not going to function properly. It's like, you know, the driver, you know, being perfectly great at driving, but he's got no wheels and there's, there's no engine in the car. Right. Mm. So, and I want to echo this with another example. I think it was, I went to Cambridge once and I met this, uh, this, this gentleman and lo and behold, he had a very successful online gambling business, right? <laughs> so this is the shakawa, this is the blame with the desires going on. But he came across as a new atheist, as an empiricist, as a materialist. And I think I spent about four hours with him. And unfortunately, I think I wasn't as mature maybe as I am today. Everyone's on a journey and I got a bit kind of frustrated. I said, you know what, what's your problem? <laughs> I said, tell me, what's your problem? And he said to me, the Quran says the world is flat. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Anyway, that's not true, number one. But I said, yes, it does. You prove to me the world is round. Mm -hmm. I, I just went crazy like that, right? I said, yeah, it does. You prove to me the world is round. Come on, Mr. Materialist, Mr. Empiricist. I am telling you, he was so embarrassed. Every argument he was giving me wasn't in line with his own epistemology. He was like, oh, it's in the science textbooks. Mm, interesting, I said. Did you empirically verify that yourself? No, these are pictures that someone else took that says that this is Earth. You may have, a, you may have millions of pictures that are the same, but you didn't do it yourself. So according to your own epistemic criteria, right, this is not evidence. Then he was like, oh, if I put a camera on a rocket and I send it up uh, you know, through the atm atmosphere into space, I can see the roundness on the Earth. I said, have you done that before? No. Someone else has done that. But you have to believe that that was the case and it was actually Earth. This is more testimony rather than anything that you've directly experienced. Then he, I think he said something like, what if, you, if I go on a plane, I go in a straight line, I'll come back to the same place which shows the Earth is round, which I don't th think that's even true. But <laughs> I said, have you done it? No. Then he was like, if I go on a mountain, I could see the curvature of the Earth. I was like, okay. Doesn't mean you're making an inference is round. It could be a semicircle. It could be a flower shape, right? Anyway, he was going on and on and on, stuff like that. And then he said, I got it. I've got it. The shadows. He mentioned shadows, Paul. And I was like, you poor sod. Mm -hmm. I didn't say those words, but I said, I said, indeed, in the alternation of the night and day are signs for people who reflect. Wow, wow. I'm telling you, from what I remember, his mouth was on the floor. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting because when Allah talks about the taqwir, right? The wrapping, yeah? It's like the wrapping a, a turban on a, wrap, on a head, which is round, yeah? The mm -hmm. alternation of the night and day, yeah? And I think it comes from the word kur, which means ball in Arabic as well. And we had uh, scholars, you know, that predate modern science that even spoke about it was yeah. it was round. Ibn Taymiyyah quotes, I think Ibn Munada that talks about that the world was round. He quotes it back to the early three centuries, the Salaf, yeah, the pious predecessors that the world is round. Ibn Hazm talks about the world being round. I think Al Ghazali mentions the consensus and so on and so forth. Not that we that you know we're fixated on the idea. It, it's, it, for, for me, the Quran is multi level If you want to read a flat earth in it, then so be it. If you want to read a round earth, so be it. Right? You know, you're not. You're not a kafir if you believe the world is is flat, for example. Yeah. The point is, Allah uses a language that's appropriate for people's limited understanding to conclude a timeless truth, which is something about who, how we should relate to Him and who He is. And that's the amazing nature of the multi-layered and multi-level aspect of the Quranic verse. You could have different readings depending on what your own metaphysical or your own uh, experiences are or your own limitations are but even if you have inaccurate understandings of reality it, the reflective process if you're sincere will make you conclude to will make you conclude a timeless truth that allah is talking about which is his creative agency and that is worthy of worship anyway mm -hmm. we could talk about another time that's that's the topic of my phd but the point here is these type of experiences happen all the time paul all the time i could give you so we could be here for another hour and possibly i could be giving you experience after experience now don't get me wrong some people have valid intellectual concerns but we have those answers i may not have the answers but collectively as a community we have those answers yeah mm. and uh, yeah. I, just want to say, I mean one of the i noticed uh, uh, quite a while ago i uh, was reading the quran uh, about uh, uh disbelievers but people who are actively oppose faith i don't mean christians i, I mean people yes. who are 
hostile to faith as such is that the way the Quran talks about the personalities of these people, their character, their dispositions, their attitudes, the mockery, the, the derision. I, I mean, it's almost like the Quran was a psychology textbook for people I was meeting at Speaker's Corner. It was, it, was, it was so extraordinarily true and insightful as to the personality types that one was witnessing. And I'm not making it up, but I thought, well, wow, this, is, this is something I experience every Sunday, you know. Mm. Uh, so it, the, the, it was almost as if the crime is a psychology of atheism or a psychology of unbelief in that respect. I thought that was rather extraordinary. No, I agree. That's why, you know, mm. I think it was uh, Ustad Numan Ali Khan, he made a very interesting point many years ago. I think he said, you don't read the Quran, the Quran mm -hmm. reads you. And even Sheikh Hamza Yusuf mentioned something a few years ago, I believe. He said, he said, I think it was, I'm going to try and quote him directly. He said, Wallahi, you will find yourself in the Quran. Oh, yeah, yeah. which is very interesting very very interesting mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean so these th so this is my kind of uh, experience and we we deal with this on a kind of weekly basis with and people from different demographic backgrounds different cultures different ethnicities different you know academic backgrounds different abilities and you're seeing this trend and this just reinforces what we spoke about saying the fitra and so on and so forth but however i don't want to I don't want people to think that people don't have intellectual concerns because the Quran, you know, has a lot of reasoned argument as well. If they say this, then say that. So there is a sense of, you know, argumentation and reasoning, and we should do it in the best, best possible manner, of course. Mm. And there are some people who have valid intellectual concerns, but you, but we have those answers, and when we address them, then that may reveal the kind of psycho-emotive thing that they have. I remember I had this debate in Cambridge many years ago. I. I I think it was filmed, but we never published it, or, or, or it wasn't edited, or it's in the archives. I'm going to try and get it. It was with the famous Humayun scholar. His name was Simon Blackburn, right? Oh, the I had it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, I, 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 he I, was a Humayun scholar. I and Allah is my witness, and I'm going to try and get the footage. It's like mm. maybe, maybe over possibly 14, 13 years ago now. Yeah, he, I gave him an argument. Then he basically said. I don't care about arguments. Mm. That's what he said. I just care about values now. So he presupposed a kind of, he's a humanist philosopher as well. He presupposed humanism to be true. Mm. So when he was getting friction concerning intellectually, because we're on the intellectual battleground, we're giving him some friction and he felt, okay, that, you know, they have a strong argument. He shifted the discussion. It, I, in actual fact, it was so embarrassing. One of his students was whispering behind his ear to give him an answer about something. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong, I respect the professor, you know, he's done some great work and so on and so forth. But that's just another example to show to you that even when you provide an answer, don't assume that their main issue was intellectual, that they have other, you know, uh, moral or ideological commitments that they don't want to give up because it's connected to a psycho-emotive driving force. And mm. I think this is why liberalism, coming back to the original point, mm. this is why liberalism and even postmodernism are one of the greatest forces that are going to be challenging the Islamic discourse. And they are challenging the Islamic discourse, of, mm. hopefully not successfully, of course, but we have a role to play because liberalism is the primacy of the self, the primacy of the individual. And then what you see going on all around the world when it comes to things like, you know, my body, my choice, when it comes to abortion, when it comes to the LGBTQ plus ideology, sometimes we're not well equipped and how to address these things. And because as Muslims, we're human beings, psychologically, we have a need to belong, which is part of, you know, the development of the social norm is based on your need to belong and you need to feel certain. This is informational social influence or normative social influence. This is part of who we are. So I get why some Muslims might find it difficult and they, because we're living in a liberal secular world, we, we may even have secular liberal affinities that we're not even aware of. Mm. And we'll be like, yeah, it is my body. Yeah, it is my choice. It is my free choice. And they won't understand the ideological baggage behind these terms. So I think it's very important for us to now start to understand that there are, everything has its own philosophical baggage and assumptions. Take, for example, this port, right? And I'm actually writing an essay on this at the moment. We're going to, hopefully it's going to be published uh, this month. Take the start that, you know, same-sex intercourse, right? There's an argument by some people that same-sex intercourse is not morally blameworthy. It's, it's, it's not morally uh, reprehensible. It's totally fine. Now, and I'm not, 
passing a moral judgment here. Let's, um, um, let's unpack this philosophically. Yeah? Mm. The thing that's very important that we need to understand is this. Every statement, every claim, every postulation has its own moral philosophical assumptions. So I would argue, what are the philosophical assumptions of that claim? Well, the philosophical assumptions are at least three main assumptions or two. Let's just stick to two for now. Number one, self-ownership. The one who's making the claim believes that individual humans own their bodies. Number two, they believe it is my individual right. So they have a particular notion of individual rights. So we just need to unpack them. Now, the reason they believe there's an assumption is because if they believe they could do what they want with their bodies, right, mm. as long as it doesn't seemingly harm anybody, which we can discuss, that's another debate to be had, but we don't have to have that debate now. They would be like, well, it doesn't seemingly harm anyone. Let me just do what I want with myself. So it assumes self-ownership. The other assumption is a particular liberal notion of individual rights because they think they think this is my individual right because it's been dictated by a particular liberal discourse which is premised on individualism, which is premised on the idea that the primacy is on the individual. So there's a particular conception, a liberal conception of rights. All we need to say as Muslims is you have these assumptions. Why do you think I have to have the same assumptions as you? Mm. That is bigotry. And they call us the bigots. Paul, mm. I'm a true believer of the Quran. Chapter, I think it's chapter, Surah Muntahana, chapter 60, verse 8. Allah does not forbid you to be kind and just with those who do not fight you for religion and do not expel you from your homes. Allah uses the word bir, the same word he uses on how to treat your parents. It's like an intense mercy and kindness for all people. So wherever you are, if you're not fighting me physically, right, and you're not expelling me from my home, I'm going to be just and kind to you, right? So you're the bigot because you're forcing these more philosophical assumptions on me. I don't believe because I'm someone who affirms Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, the oneness of God. I don't believe I own my body. Allah has this is called the Tawheed of Rububiyyah. This is his, the oneness of his creative agency that he owns. He's created everything. He owns everything. He maintains everything. He shapes everything. He's the master of everything, right? So Allah owns my body. So he has the right to tell me what to do with my body, number one. So I don't follow your assumption. Number two, I believe in individual rights. In the Islamic tradition, we believe in hukuk al-ibad, the rights of the individual, for sure. But what conception of rights? Why do you assume a liberal conception is the only conception? Why do you assume that the conception of rights has to be a particular conception that gives primacy over the nafs, over the individual? We don't have that philosophy. We believe Allah created us and he is the one who has the right to give us our rights. So it's about conception of rights here. Now they may argue, but I don't believe in Allah and I don't believe he owns our body. That's a different discussion and that's the discussion that we want to have with you. We don't want to have this ideological nonsense discussion, forcing assumptions down each other's throats and making you believe in a certain particular worldview. I want you to have an intellectual discussion on our worldview, the foundations. Okay, and this is what we want to, to take them. We want to have this, this discussion on Tawheed and yeah. show to them, don't be bigots and forcing this down our throats because we don't adopt your assumptions. We have a particularly different paradigm and that paradigm comes from Allah and we could explain it to you. But the problem with that, I, I would submit, pushing back on that, although everything you said is, is valid in itself, the problem is this. I, I was at a certain well-known university a couple of days ago and um, I'm not going into the details, but I... I it became very clear that there were certain subjects that, uh, that one couldn't speak of at the university, um, which uh, uh, to do with what you've already mentioned. And one, I couldn't even begin the conversation that you're talking about. I couldn't begin to unpack the philosophical presuppositions of moral autonomy and individual rights and alternative paradigms. We couldn't even get it off the ground because it would have been cancelled. So... Or what, although what you're saying is true, but it, it, liberalism is not an open society anymore. It used to be an open society. I remember Karl Popper's famous work, The Open Society and Its Enemies. This is the great liberal uh, political philosopher of the 1940s, 1950s, um, uh, Karl Popper. And the enemies of the free society were Marxism and Plato and all this stuff. But we don't live in that society anymore. The enemies of the open society, I would suggest, are liberals. Because yes. they not only have these presuppositions that you so articulately characterize, but they suppress 
alternatives, all alternatives at the pain, at the very least of can, you know, having your platform cancelled, but at the worst criminal prosecution, you can lose your job, you could be shamed, you could be shamed and vilified publicly, like some medieval kind of inquisition where you're, you know, um, and this is the reality. So y y your argument is intellectually coherent, but how do we deploy your argument in a world where one cannot deploy it? Now, uh, perhaps you may be saying, well, we can do it on social media platforms or maybe on TikTok, on your on Sapiens Institute. Yeah, I see that. But this is we are. Are we not pushed to the margins? Are we not left to those spaces where the state has yet to fully encroach and shut us down? Are, are we not yeah. in a very I mean, difficult situation? Yeah, Paul, you're right. I mean, what it does require, it requires a collective effort now. Um, f different people from different parts of the Islamic spectrum, if you like. And we need to kind of raise our voices in the best way possible. And it can be done. Like I did this in one of the most elite universities in Pakistan. Very, very liberal. But I didn't start with the LGBT question. I started it as a workshop. I said, look, let's pick an idea. For example, secularism is neutral. Mm -hmm. As thinkers, as philosophers, you're supposed to be the future thinkers of the world. What kind of assumptions does that have? So we started, I gave them certain examples and then so they got the logical idea of what I was trying to do and then I applied it to a, this, this idea, which was same-sex intercourse is perfectly morally fine. Mm -hmm. And I said, what about this? What do you think the assumptions are here? And I put them in a position where they couldn't say there was no assumptions because they already went through that workshop with me or that, that process, that pedagogy, right, if you want, or that kind of Socratic way of thinking. Yeah. I did this at LSE, the London School of Economics, and there was an academic there, right? It's how it's done as well, but you're right. The right. power structures in play are never going to allow this to happen. And even if you're the most polite, the most compassionate, the most articulate, yeah. and if you say, I'm not going to harm anyone, I love everybody, I'll give you CPR, I'll take care of your kids, I'll be the best neighbor, <laughs> they still would try and find something about you because we live in this kind of... It's, it's, it's a nasty word. And that's why, unfortunately, Paul, we may just need social and intellectual martyrs, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, we need people to stand up as best as possible, to write books, write articles, give speeches, you know, do their thing and articulate themselves in the best way possible. But those people need to be supported. And that's why, bro, you know, not to throw dust in your face, but your channel is a phenomenal channel. I'm a huge mm -hmm. supporter, as you know, privately and publicly. And, um, you know, you're going to, you may get your challenges in the future as well. You're going to get half a million subscribers. You may get a million very soon, inshallah. And then you may get your own challenges too. You don't know. We have to prepare for the worst, think for the best. Mm -hmm. And we have to support you. We have to support other people, support me, support other brothers. We have to come together. And we also have to create good alliances because we have this kind of very binary way of thinking that it's just the Muslims. I mean, this, this doesn't even make sense of the seerah. The Prophet ﷺ had alliance with his uncle in a way. He would, his uncle was like a form of his protection. Obviously, he was from Allah. But we have to create this alliance of virtue, right? This is a very important term to you. Like alliance of virtue. That's a nice term. Yeah, of course, because the Prophet Salam said this as well. When after he became prophet, he said, if I was asked again to, you know, the preservation of virtue, you know, if you know the famous story in the Sira where the, the, the tribes were arguing and who's going to put the, the black stone onto the Kaaba, oh, yeah. and that could have created a big fight or war. Yeah. And the Prophet Sallam basically said, you know, get a cloth and put the stone on there. Each, yeah. you know, leader of the tribe or representative of the tribe holds an aspect of, uh, an, an, a, you know, a corner or an aspect of the cloth that they could put it together. So they're all responsible. He said, if I was asked to do that again, I would do that again. And wow. this is an amazing, amazing teaching we have from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We need to have alliances of virtue but because we're very ethnocentric when it comes to religion we think it's this this badge that you wear or this color that you have or this food that you have islam is a way of being like mm. jihad is struggle a mujahid is someone who struggles a muslim is someone who surrenders it's a way of being it's not an ethno-religious cult right it's a way of being and we've become very identitarian if that's a word to use with regards to religion but islam is a way of being what you have in your heart what you set in your tongue how you relate to yourself how you relate to others and how you relate to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we need to have alliances of virtue and if we do that we have tawakkal we have reliance on allah i think over time something can happen but there is a wider discussion to be had that this is primarily ide uh, political and ideological meaning yeah. you need to have some form of authority and that's why we need to start to engage with 
engaging with people of influence because people of influence would help us have our own sense of authority so we could have our own positions and we could articulate ourselves peacefully and in the right manner without being you know marginalized as as you referred to so it's it's difficult times yes but uh you know this this is what it's all about right it's this paradise is not here paradise is to come inshallah so we need to work hard well indeed well uh, thank you very much I indeed and we've been discussing uh on and off uh, this amazing book the divine reality god islam and the mirage uh, of Aether, the new revised uh, edition it's very readable um and it's very uh, grounded in uh, philosophy and uh, and and recent evidences and science and uh, and theology uh, i recommend that i also I always recommend this other book um not by hamza uh the quran and the secular mind a philosophy oh, beautiful. Book, um, yes by dr shabit actor uh, from oxford university uh, th this is a, a fantastic uh, um, analysis, a very philosophical analysis of the nature of secularism and how the Quran um, uh, can analyze that and respond to uh, the secular mind. A uh, very powerful, beautiful. It's uh, one of Tim Winters uh, on his recommended oh, readings, um, although in, in the advanced category. Sorry. You just to mention this book. I know the Dr. Shabir Akhtar. I've been to his house. We've, we've, we've engaged very well. He told me the story behind this book, and the story behind this book was he wanted to go through the whole of the Quran with a secular atheistic mind, and any verse where a secular person, an atheist, would basically question, he would provide an answer. And wow. this book has more references to the Quran than any other book I think I've ever read. Right? It's, it's, uh, every paragraph is a reference. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just phenomenal. I'm not doing it because you, you spend your whole life just going through the Quran references. But you're right. Absolutely. And, and I actually cite Shabir Akhtar in 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 my book as well. So it's I, I would definitely recommend that book as well. Yeah, it's an extraordinary. It's, it's one of my uh, uh, you know my, my most precious books. I, I, I've lost count of how many editions of this I bought and given away, but it's a, a remarkable book. Both of those books, The Divine Reality, The Crime and Secular Mind, will arm you intellectually and spiritually because they're both very profoundly spiritual books for the struggles ahead. And inshallah, um, with God's help, we, we will uh, endure. Oh. And, and the religion of God will, he will ensure its survival, uh, of course. Um, but, uh, but thank you very much indeed, uh, Hamza, for your time. Uh, and, and you're incredibly busy. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, listening to you and uh, and interacting with you. It's a great privilege. It's always great having these conversations, Paul. Honestly, I, I learn a lot and uh, I always leave the room, you know, bouncy and excited because, uh, you know, may Allah preserve you, may Allah preserve the channel, may Allah bless you and may Allah grant you and your loved ones and, you know, everyone you hold dear and friends, family and so on and so forth. Grant them the best in this life and the best in life to come. Inshallah, inshallah. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Hamza. Until next time. Thank you.